Hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webcast. My name is Andrew Baba. I'm a senior contributing editor at eSchool News, and I will be acting as the moderator for today's presentation, which is sponsored by Jamf Software. It's titled, Getting the Most Out of Apple with Device Management. Before I introduce our speaker, Dave Saltmarsh, I want to just take a few moments to highlight a couple of items. First, uh, today's event will be recorded, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. In a, in a couple of days, we'll send you an email that will contain a link to the recorded event, and you'll also be able to download a PDF of the presentation, if you like. And secondly, please do ask questions, and you do not have to wait as if you have to uh, wait until the end. Uh, if at any time during the presentation you have a question, just type it into the Q&A box on your console and hit the Submit button. I hope we'll have 10, maybe 15 minutes at the end when Dave can answer your questions. We do have a chat function, which can be launched via the brown group chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Use chat to talk among yourselves or to contact me or the eSchool News team with any technical issues or other concerns. However, please don't use the chat function to ask Dave questions. He will probably not have time to monitor the chat. If you have a question for Dave, please use the Q&A panel instead. With that out of the way, let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Dave Saltmarsh has a terrific job title. He is Education Evangelist at Jamf Software. He is also a career educator who, over the course of 18 years, worked as a classroom teacher turned IT and library director in Arizona and Maine. In addition to managing all facets of information technology, he's led implementations in one-to-one -one computers for students, as well as handheld programs, and has focused on personalized learning. Over the last five years, he has traveled globally and gained a worldwide perspective on the use of technology in schools and business. Dave has a master's degree in instructional technology and has earned COSIN's Certified Educational Technology Leader distinction. Now, we have had some phone issues with Dave, so if he drops off at any time, there might be a few moments of silence while he dials back in. But in the meantime, hopefully he's there. And Dave, welcome to our webinar today. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much, Andrew, and I, and I really appreciate that introduction, and, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to everyone who's taken uh, time out of their valuable day to, uh, to attend this uh, presentation, getting the most out of Apple with uh, device management. The Apple ecosystem that has been around for years that many of us as educators have been using it for a long time provides a, a, a well a uh, documented range of potential for learning. Now, some of you have come to this presentation today to hear how uh, uh, mobile device management can help guide you in your journey. But the thing is, it really depends on you and who you are and where you are. And with hundreds of people registered tuning in today, from teachers to school administrators, superintendents, instructional leaders, certainly systems IT technicians, and, and others, we have to figure out, you know, where are you? Um, maybe you haven't even chosen to implement Apple uh, products, or you've been doing it for years and you're just trying to see what's out there that's new to help you in your roles. So I'm going to hopefully guide you to, to see what are some of the new things, the potential that is out there that not only can help you with this ecosystem, and deploying the, the uh, hardware, but also utilizing the best potential of all of the apps and content available on the Apple platform. Because really, that's why most of us got into this business to begin with. It was to transform learning. In the early days, we as educators using technology were the practitioner of the technology. As it became somewhat uh, larger scale and more complicated, IT practices had to be put in place for good reason. What we're able to do now is transform those practices that let us pretty much get back to focusing on the original intent, which is transforming classroom practices. 
to start off with, I just want to give a, get a, give a sense of the educational IT experience and how it's become more balanced, before I get into some specifics, that I believe are going to address some issues no matter what your role is when you've tuned in today. You know, in the past, in years past, we had to become very focused on institutional needs and security. Today, it's, and, and Apple has been aware of this for several years, perhaps even by some criticized, but now validated in the importance of end-user privacy and how vital that is. And for many of us, that, that was foremost in our minds. And sometimes technology things within an institution were, were, were um, com, uh, up against each other. Now we can balance to bring both. Just like when we, you know, depending on the size of your institution and what you're doing, once we scaled out of me using uh, devices in my own classroom to supporting more classrooms, to schools, almost got away from that ability, which was the beginnings of, of why I got into becoming a teacher and others did, was to provide individual students great experience differentiating to their needs. Scaled management, uh, one time, scaled and management wasn't really happening. Things were having to be one size fits all. Now we can get back to focusing on the end user and their specific needs. The same goes for productivity. Um, I mentioned that one size fits all. It doesn't really support anyone. Empowering users so that they can take advantage of the platform and the ecosystem with less restrictions, and yet at the same time ensuring consistency as needed across an organization, you know, making sure people have the right updates and such, but not prohibiting them from getting to what they need to do and especially when we don't know where people are going because of the great potential, we certainly don't want to limit their ability to learn or to even go down paths we hadn't even considered. So technology has come around. We want to make sure these are balanced, and we're going to get into this piece. Just like the full life cycle, we certainly want to be able to get to the point where it's no longer based on a calendar when uh, an institution can deploy a new piece of software that's vital for, for improving some students' learning that they just got access to because we have to wait for uh, the traditional downtime required. 24-7, anytime, anywhere, doesn't necessarily mean from September 3rd through uh, June 20, you know, 20th. Maybe we need users to have the devices all the time and, and not have to even turn them in. Can we get to that stage so that we can have less roadblocks to learning. That's what I'm hoping to show some of you, uh, show, show through some of what I'm doing. And to meet both sides, from the IT practices to the instructional, we want to look at traditionally device management might be looked at from a ROI perspective because traditionally it's purchased by uh, the systems IT to manage the devices. And, and they care very heavily on return of investment, and rightfully so. Most of the time, however, those decisions are limited mostly to saving time and saving money, both hugely important topics and absolutely something that you can get most out of your Apple platform by uh, being able to take care of this. However, if, we, if, we, if we're all working together in an institution, we realize that VOI, or the value of that investment, is as important. In fact, it's the whole rationale. Most educational institutions went down the path of implementing technology. It wasn't to necessarily to save money. It wasn't necessarily to save time from an IT's perspective. But in classrooms, reducing lost instructional time, being able to support uh, pro uh, professional development that gets teachers changing their instruction, like uh, aligned with the SAMR model, so we can move from simple substitution to, to, to you know, modification and transformational learning, supporting personalized learning models, uh, supporting the implementation of Common Core. Those are kind of the things that really drove the need to look at technology. But let's not let the technology drive how we can support these. So we want to look at both things. So I'm going to suggest go through some of the uh, 
device management aspects that cover both an ROI perspective and a VOI perspective. And hopefully we can see that by, by transforming these IT practices, we are bringing uh, multiple parts of an organization together and we're breaking down some silos. We're going to talk about deployment and provisioning, which, you know, to many of us in the uh, been around for a while in IT, that's like imaging, getting devices to be set up to begin with, be able to get them out to users. Going to go over the, the, the needs of being it for software and content for distribution. Now, at the same time, that's, you know, that might have been licensing back in the day, and that's why it had to be taken out of my hands when I was a classroom teacher and managed by, by district so that you could uh, keep, you know, keep valid and, and stay compliant. And at the same time, security and settings uh, are, are important. And, you know, really, that's also today, it's about protecting the end user. When people think about security and settings, that makes sense. But let's also make sure we're putting things in place that are securing the privacy of our users. And that's just as important and a value as is the time and energy it takes to do it. So I'm going to go into in a little bit in depth in, in, in the first topic, deployment and provisioning from an ROI perspective. Certainly uh, inventory and finances are important to us. Um, being able to modular uh, create systems rather than having to uh, make very sophisticated uh, images that are uh, like almost this one size. Being able to, to, to simply create a new software setup for a different school versus all the time and energy that used to be put into place certainly is a huge time saver for IT. And it eliminates that having to mass, you know, change things for that one end user, when that's the norm, uh, it isn't so much effort uh, because you're already doing that on the large scale. Uh, a new person comes in, a special, a special ed um, teacher who moves from building to building, all of a sudden needs different things. It doesn't take a lot of time just to get them set up because it becomes the norm. And this zero touch idea, being able to not have to drive out to a building to meet somebody to take care of the need, but have it just pretty much show up or be available for them on their device. The time and energy that an IT department has to put into those kind of ticket items that an end user could end up being taken care of on their own really do come go a long way to saving that time and energy ROI. I'll cover one little aspect, uh, one little aspect here of this of how you're seeing Apple improve things, it's, such as the device enrollment program, or known to some as the DEP. Eliminating the bottlenecks of getting devices up and running and having to have an entire staff dedicated to come in and then prepare devices before the upcoming school year really lets them get back to other tasks and it doesn't stop, uh, take the time that would normally be involved with getting that end user up and running. So now a device can be purchased, uh, assigned and aligned to a, device, a mobile device management server through Apple, and easily get set up in, uh, with activation. That also goes a long way if somebody has an issue with the device. Pretty much just resetting the device and re-signing in with their account information gets that device back up in that original state. Now, that's hugely important to the IT. Um, think about the end user, though, and that getting it back up very easily without ever having to really physically go anywhere to do it. Some of us, though, would also like the DEP part of fixing most problems with device reset. In other words, if a device is wiped out or reset, we don't have to worry about person getting their hands on that and getting around what settings were put on it because the only way they could use the device is re-authenticating, which is going to put the device back exactly as the institution had decided. Um, that goes a long way, too, to uh, helping reduce uh, stolen devices, the usefulness of a stolen device when it pretty much can't be done, uh, used unless somebody has the right credentials to get back on. Now, on the value of this, this aspect, think about the just-in-time access 
updated versions of applications. The number of times as a math teacher uh, a new product came out in October or an update that was critical and, and the delay in getting that to myself and my students are all gone now with the potential of moments after an update's come in, it can be made available remotely with zero touch to myself and students. That's significant uh, uh, reduction of lost instructional time. And think about, you know, unless it's a, a non-hardware repair, there's so much now uh, of getting that user's device back up and running if, if for some reason it's having abnormalities. And again, really focused on that idea of, of keeping the downtime. You know, obviously if a device is uh, accidentally damaged or something like that, there has to be uh, repair involved. But so much can be done now either remotely or by, in many cases, a simple um, reset. And, and so many schools, and while I do know that sports, football, and different things still kind of keep some districts and schools tied to a traditional calendar, I worked in several um, year-round institutions when I was a classroom teacher, and I loved the environment. Then I was with another district who wanted to. Uh, back in the day where we had to create an image and start deciding in May what was going to go on the computers and collect them all and redistribute them all back, you know, and have a, a process. We can get away from that. We can focus on anytime, anywhere, at any pace learning and reduce that. You know, the idea of trying to extend the school day. Imagine extending the calendar when we don't have to have uh, tied to these. Uh, again, implementing a new curriculum without having to plan it for a holiday break is going to be significant for education. And so I mentioned this idea of, of making it easier for IT. Think about a, a user getting notification. Being able to install new apps without whether or not they have admin rights and IT having to not, you know, whether they have to show up and, you know, whether you do or don't give administrative rights to your teachers or students, less of an issue when you can still do things like uh, installing and putting settings on from the end user's console. And when I think about setting up someone's email, or probably printers were one of those big ones. We had a big special ed staff who would go out to a building, and I'd have to arrange for a technician to meet them on site so they could set the printers up. And I've got this special ed coordinator who's, who's a brilliant, extremely smart person having to hang at weight coordinate with, and then even feel, you know, less empowered. Whereas now they can walk in a building and the right printers show up for them and it's a simple click if they want to add the appropriate printer rather than a, a coordinated meeting with IT. You know, getting content because they belong to a certain part of an organization, you know, without having to necessarily have someone come visit them. And if there's one aspect that I have seen do a drastic change in attitudes um, for, for personal personnel is the simple little IT trick that they would do that used to mean coming out to a device. And we've all seen the Saturday Night Live parody of a, a not-so-nice technology person telling a person to move away from their computer when all they did is get on and run some little command or script. Well, those could be provided to the end user for them to run. Maybe they get an email saying, go oh, in, you know, to self-service and simply click on this such and such tool and it's probably going to take care of your issue. No one showing up and the end user feeling empowered. So ROI, on, we're going to switch to software and content distribution. Certainly we can get the uh, software installed simply and easily now. I've kind of covered that. The licenses though and compliance tracking. I used to have to keep file cabinets with names and locations. Now being able to monitor that and even having automated ability to um, have notification. And for me, that's, you know, today's a lot of software licensing from the IT perspective is we're given latitude to go over licensing sometimes and have to true up at the end of the year. But budgeting for that, you know, how do you plan for that? Well, you can have notifications that, okay, you've hit, you're getting, you know, percentage or you've hit your, your max number, which means you either have to stop or you're going to have to true up at some point and plan for that. You know, and being able to re-identify, think of the licensing and cost savings of you know, not just time of running around uninstalling, but
But if I recognize that a lab is only using 10 seats of a specialized Adobe product and it has 25 seats, maybe I can pull those back and redistribute them. I don't have to necessarily buy a site license of some software that I used to use uh, because myself and others included um, like some visual software, um, Kidspiration, Inspiration. Maybe we're only buying so many licenses and we distribute to the right people that need it rather than every single person gets it and only a small percentage use it. So that uh, savings in funds is significant on an ROI. The volume purchase program, another one of Apple's you know, pieces that has evolved that continue to help education, this, this idea of being able to take full advantage of the Apple ecosystem and distribute material, content, and apps to students. And, and that's, you know, that's been a basic need practice of, of IT for a very long time. And we've had tools to do this. So the volume purchase program certainly lets us do that, and, that, and that's very important. Obviously, and very significant to the uh, K-12 type of environment, is retaining that ownership. And that's something that as Apple's evolved and expanded this service, now we have this ability to retain ownership and redistribute apps back out, just like we would have done in years past. I actually see this leading to, towards app developers perhaps making even more riching and engaging content. So on the VOI side of things <clears throat> with software, imagine software distribution at your need. Um, I've already talked about the personal, uh, being able to get it right then and there. But with the self-service model, we don't necessarily have to force it to be installed on an end user's device who may or may not need it. We can make it available to them. And in some cases, you know, a lot of people don't even know what's on their machine. But if you uh, make it available in another easier way to get it, uh, I remember the first time I had staff walk in and go, what, where's all the different apps? And it's like, well, they're in self-service. You decide which ones you want. And like, I get to decide? I get to install what I need? Sure, there's a couple different um, you know, productivity apps. Uh, which one do you want to use? Uh, here's the basic one the district wants, and we've already had that installed. But giving them options, even if they're going to end up choosing the one you expect them to, still goes a long way to empowering users. Mostly for me, though, it's this personalized experience. It's this concept. That we are able to that we are able to differentiate down to the end user what they need, and uh, you know I'm just going to speak from experience as a dyslexic student. There's certain software my company provides to me that not everybody else in the company needs. Uh, same goes through for for students. Um, just not a need necessarily to do that, but. Before, we were limited because it was one size fits all. They didn't have funding to be able to go out and buy that other software, that specialized software. So, you know, customizing that device down to the individual needs, hugely important. I've mentioned self-service a couple times. It's idea for an end user to go get what they need, maybe go get uh, settings for uh, setting up a printer uh, that they need that somebody else doesn't need. Now, the, the last big section, you know, really exciting, of course, always, is security and setting management. Now, hugely important on a, uh, an importance on a, uh, in, in protecting institution information. And it's, you know, any institution cares about, uh, in some cases, restricting or prohibiting certain usage. But really, it's about also protecting that device if it, it is lost or stolen being able to manage and, and wipe out that data so it's, it's only in the hands of the right people. You know, school IT, we spent so many years just reacting. Now IT can get to, with the, hopefully some freed up time, scheduling and planning routine maintenance because, you know, that, you know, it's a huge part of a workload on an IT department. Being able to auto-schedule some things and run tasks. You know, finding out that your superintendent doesn't have, have the last security thing because he's always running around you can't meet up with him. Well, if you can do that behind the scenes and remotely, you know, you're, you're protecting them. At the same time, you're not uh, inhibiting them from doing their day-to-day -day job. And 
But we've all learned that if you can get the right preferences to the right person rather than that one size fits all, those people are able to do what they need to do. And if I can do that without much touch, I'm going to reduce those help desk calls and save those help desk calls and the IT's, you know, uh, working to more higher level type activities. And if you can do that, we've saved time, we've saved money, and we're able to put our resources into the right place. On an iOS side, think about that end user, again, getting, receiving notifications that there's an update uh, if they want to go get it. Uh, they could be told that there's going to be an outage. They're going to be able to install the apps and settings just like they could on the Mac side. And the ever important, getting your own email, not having to go see somebody to set that up. Now, App Store restrictions is one I wanted to point out because often with this one-size-fits-all IT concept and in schools, and, 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 and you could decide this on a whole or not, but now we have the ability to restrict App Store access. However, because we use the self-service model, schools and institutions can still make apps available to people to download without necessarily compromising the access to the App Store if they don't want it. Keep in mind, and I'm about to get into this in more specific, we want to be able to do this on an individual basis and not a widespread all or nothing type approach. So this is a, maybe a new thing to some people, this ability to not let students, if they want to go get any app, but make apps, other apps available as they come up that this institution has decided. Letting things catch up with me for a second. Now on the security uh, settings on the VOI, you know, math customization. You know, there's um, inevitable, a book called Inevitable about math customization. And quite frankly, uh, when some people heard this term a few years ago as bringing it up, they thought it was an oxymoron type thing or how do you do this? Well, quite frankly, being able to scale, large scale, tens of thousands, whether it's hundreds of people, tens of thousands, 100,000 people in a school district, and you want to mass customize their learning and their experience. And we can do that through mobile device management that we couldn't do before to group and individual privileges. I mentioned about the software, but think about me having gone through, you know, you hear about the four C's, uh, collaboration, communication, creativity, critical thinking. Now we're adding uh, uh, citizenship to that level, digital citizenship. Students earn privileges. We can group and individualize those privileges. All freshmen get this content. Uh, all freshmen who have done such and such get this content. On the flip side, think about group and individual restrictions. Remember the day when it was, we're going to have to turn off the camera for every kid. Well, maybe based upon those very same things I mentioned, we're going to be able to do something. Well, we can do something. Sorry. I remember the days when I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could? Privileges and restrictions. Get away from this model. Uh, this model of one size fits all for everybody just doesn't work, and it never really has. Um, sure, it, it, it's been simple, and it made it easy for people to do, but it didn't support the real reason we got the technology in the first place. We want to be able to say, I have a group of students, staff, whatever, and they've earned the right to have certain access. Certain students haven't. They're in a different group. Perhaps as a student um, moves along the continuum of digital citizenship, they've earned access to their camera or open access to the App Store. You can give certain students apps access to the App Store while other students are limited just to self-service. And that is the ability, the things we can do today with device management. And maybe I move a student back into a different group for whatever reason. Uh, they, you know, if I see a struggling student and we notice that they're not being successful, maybe I have to remove some privileges that they were given. So that's a big part of the personalization model concept that we can achieve today with the Apple platform and the tools that Jamf provides with the mobile device management. Going a little bit further and realizing that uh, a big piece of what we're trying to accomplish in transforming IT practices uh, that's returning. And, and this is a big, a big piece that's 
always comes at in best practices. We want to see collaborative teams from the beginning of an implementation. Worst thing I've ever done is sat between a systems technology director and an instructional technology director at conference, and the instructional didn't even know that the systems had just bought our system, uh, bought, bought Casper Suite. And it was like, wow, you should have been part of that collaborative team helping to define the need. It's great that you, you did it, but think about having they had brought all stakeholders in. And they would have heard that they, the special ed director wants to be able to maintain ownership and purchasing rights to apps, and that the math coordinator wants to do the same thing. They want to be able to. A specific school wants to have ownership of the apps that they purchase and manage of that. And so transforming IT practices has gone a long way to eliminating that single point of knowledge. Well, and that could be in the fact that we have professional development that goes beyond you know, reaching that one technician, but it's also that single point of that choke point within a district and, and sharing that out because 15 years ago, well, as a library <laughs> librarian slash IT director, I managed all of the purchases of books and a lot of content and audiovisual stuff. And we can return some of these tasks to the appropriate role. For instance, you know, and so uh, my special ed director, I know from 15, several years ago, would have still wanted to have ownership. Some device management systems may only allow, limit you to how many people can be purchasers. We want to give that back. We want to make sure the tool is simple enough that a lot, sorry, <laughs> I always tell my IT people that my librarians have a better, higher degrees and are highly intelligent. When I say simpler, I mean non-technical, non having to get in and figure stuff out straightforward so they could do their normal job and be part of their normal job. And scaling for the future, for IT practices to scale for the future, they have to transform. And they have to be willing to return some things back to the original practitioner and let the technicians deal with the more techy, complicated back-end stuff. So the last little piece I'd like to get into in the little bit of time I have left is the transforming classroom practices. We've talked about the ROI and the value to the program. Let's get a little more specific. Because if you're looking at a device management application to do all those first few things, great. We can, solve, we can help both uh, the, instruction, the systems and instruction prove uh, that it's helping their programs. But let's get to the heart of what we really want to accomplish. We want to accomplish getting away and transforming classroom practice from the model of that one-size-fits-all, lecture-based, even the facilitator of instruction, so that we can move classroom practice to a model that supports you know, in and out of the classroom learning, project-based. Students not all learning at the exact, the exact content or at the exact pace, and making that teacher and comfortable by providing them resources that free them up to feel comfortable about moving throughout the room, working with a group of students, but still feeling okay that uh, learning is going on in the classroom. Creating that condition for success. And one of the things that we can point out is in the iPad world especially is the classroom management abilities. We've listened to teachers and heard uh, that the iPad and Apple platform has helped to improve teacher acceptance and we want to even support that more. There are uh, incentives today to improve teacher effectiveness, and we want to promote effective teaching practices. Teach from your feet, not from your seat. I already alluded to the creating that condition for success. It, the student success starts with the teacher being comfortable in that new environment. And there are still uh, some concerns of security. <laughs> I was a math teacher. I'm going to give math tests. I still have concerns of, uh, you know, students ne not necessarily collaborating sometimes. Sometimes I want them to. A lot of teachers want to have that management. So when it comes to iPad management, Apple has uh, responded in the uh, several versions ago, iOS 6 with guided access, um, iOS 7 with website restriction. So we, being able to do that on the fly to individuals, groups, or the entire class, is an, is an important need to supporting teachers. 
saving that valuable class time, um, I used to love to call that my class was chaotic. I loved people wa- wa- uh, walking into my room, and there was noise, and kids were overworking on things, and I'd be overworking with a group of students. At the same time, there were moments when I needed to get the kids' attention, whether it's a check for understanding. Um, I needed to be able to do it. And I had my method, and usually I talk very quietly, or I flip the lights. Well, today's environment with technology in the classroom, we still have those needs. We want to encourage teachers to get to that. We also want them to use the devices to give digital assessments, quizzes, formative assessment polling, so that they can use the power of the device um, that will save them time in some cases because they can do some auto grading, very quickly analyzing the results. You know, those are some of the great powers. However, if they can't implement these simply and quickly and easily, uh, they don't tend to embrace them. And of course, there's always high stakes exams. Uh, people want to be able to do high stakes exams, and that's that's important. Uh, it's important. Uh, to me, it's not as important as creating that great learning environment. However, it certainly uh, needs to be able to be done. Why not use the same tool? Make exam day like every day. So key feature here, uh, the last little bit I want to show you is ability for a teacher to transition a student to an app or website for any of those scenarios. Now, the old method of uh, you know, a teacher running around to devices using guided access, just quite frankly, um, doesn't really support the, the, the type of learning we want to see accomplished in a classroom. And so that teacher, you know, isn't necessarily going to be able to go around and do that. Um, the using Apple Configurator, which was a, is a great tool for some things, certainly allows somebody to do that on the, you know, pre-setting devices up if you were going to give an assessment, but it's not spontaneous. Device management whether it's uh, back, you know, Casper Suite or whatnot, you can do something from a back end to initiate guided access, and that has some, some practical use. But it doesn't go to the extent of returning the task right back into the hands of the facilitator, the practitioner, putting tools into the hands of a classroom teacher so that as she or he is in the middle of activities with kids, simply wants to get the kid's attention from their own iPad, being able to send a message out to the devices to, to simply pauses the devices and says, students, please look up because I have some wisdom I need to impart in you. Maybe it's just to say there's only 10 minutes left in the day. Maybe it's to redirect their understanding because a student has just discovered something. The teacher wants to pause the kid. Or they want to put them into a quiz or a, a, a polling app, for instance, and do a check for understanding or a math test. Teacher can do that all from their own iPad individually for students, and that's an important tool. We want to untether that teacher so that, you know what, sometimes there is that one student that needs to, to be guided access so that they'll be successful. Or they want to simply get kids to a website very quickly just so they can bookmark it, not necessarily keep them locked in it, but they want to get them to that website. Think of the time that would save a teacher if she or he could just push everybody into that website, tell them to bookmark it, and then unlock, and then the kids go about what they're doing. It's a huge time saver. Uh, Apple TV has been in the classroom. It's an amazing tool that provides spontaneous presenting and this idea of untethering so that we don't have to have the teacher's computer plugged in because, you know, they've got a $1,000 or whatever computer tied into a projector you don't want to have to have students' devices running through that. At the same time, we can actually have the teacher prompt the student from their own iPad using Casper Focus to prompt the student, the student says okay, and the student's presenting. So there are a lot of little things that can make that teacher comfortable about using the technology in their classroom. A lot of it has to do with the tool that we provide free with the Casper Suite and uh, called Casper Focus. Uh, and I just want to point that out. If you're looking at device management, really look at does it have a classroom component? And we've had one for a couple of years now, and it continues to evolve. I mentioned the messaging. We've just released that part. Now teachers can send that message. Hey, five minutes before class is up. So we're supporting these teachers, and we're 
you should be looking at supporting teachers and smoothing the transitions in their classroom. You can help show a teacher you, you can make the first five minutes a little more manageable or moving from activity or getting kids' attention. You're going to gain their acceptance uh, just by being able to pause an iPad to give a check for understanding. Switching to an app or website, saving that time in what it would normally take to get all kids on an activity, and then whether you keep them there or release them, it's still a time saver. We talked about prompting. I didn't get into too much, but imagine a teacher not having to call IT up to distribute an ebook out to their class and it show up on the kid's iPad. Significant one that's a, a huge going to support IT and, 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 and teachers in the classroom is when, when you're in a one-to-one -one situation with iPads, you want kids to have passcodes because their, their data is important and it should be private. Now, the problem is kids forget their passcodes. Well, if you, can, if you can get past that with a touch of a button, teachers are going to be happy. So you can simplify formative assessment tools, and I've covered that. The assessment, making an exam day like any other day, and the teacher is the one to initiate it, not somebody in a back-end closet or, or an a automatic system that maybe you know, only works with certain apps. We want the teacher to be able to release a student so they can get up and leave or initiate it. These are things to think about when you look at the overall ability to manage, to improve uh, as teacher acceptance, still meet all the security concerns, and promote effective teaching. And in the, in the end, we're creating that condition for success for students, which is why people adopted technology, was to support, usually it's to support that. Uh, when you think about ROI, return on investment or value, you know, people came together with great ideas on how to improve student learning, and they had that sensation that uh, here's a way to do it. What we want is the technology to support that learning, not necessarily prohibit that. We, and, and, you know, sometimes because of things got large scale and complicated, uh, we, but now we've seen this uh, come full circle. And so now with device management, we can give ID, IT the ability to do large-scale deployment and save time. At the same time, we're going to have people be more productive and uninterrupted workflows. And with the tools like DEP, we've reduced the – well, that's great in getting devices set up, and IT cares about that, but we've also reduced the risk of people that have our devices um, not getting past perhaps some of the system settings that people want on it. Mostly, we're creating that opportunity to take full advantage of that Apple ecosystem. And with the ecosystems in mind, Jamf really does look at this whole product experience from support and education and the community that, we, that, that is embracing the use of Apple technology. And it's, it's made up of so many people. Um, so many of you come from different segments from educators to administrators to systems IT, we want to make sure we're looking at everybody's needs from the very beginning. You can find out uh, more about Jamf and specific about a product. I try not to get in too specific. We have dozens of online webinars and how-to videos on using everything from Casper Focus to the back-end management of deploying and uh, provisioning devices. Please feel free to take a look at that. I really appreciate your time. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. I, I really appreciate it. And I'll, I'll hand this back uh, to Andrew to uh, handle any questions that there might be. All right. Well, terrific. Thank you so much, Dave, for what was uh, truly an excellent presentation. Uh, I found it extremely informative. We, we have about 15 minutes left, uh, and we will move on to take questions in just a second. Before we get on to those, though, I just want to like to invite all of you to take part in a quick five-question survey about how you use Apple devices in your school or district. If you, you know, looking at the, at, the, at the console, if you look, uh, if you click on the red button at the bottom right of your screen, uh, the survey will load. And it will literally just take a few moments to fill it out. Uh, and uh, we will now you know, move on. And you can do that while we move on to the questions. So all right, Dave. So, you know, we have several questions here for you. And the, the first one, um, you know, as you talk about uh, management, de management of devices, how, does this, how can this work in a school where students own their own iPad and must bring it to school every day? 
sure. And we, you know, we we support uh, many institutions that are certainly one to one and provide the devices. And sometimes they have a mixture of parts of this. Uh, absolutely do. Uh, first of all, getting uh, content and apps out to individuals can all be done on a personalized uh, device, their own device. I have my own um, iPhone. I get all the apps, my email set up, and it doesn't need to be owned by the district. The, the caveat, and, and whatever, what also what's great with that is volume purchase program. It doesn't matter if it's student-owned or personally owned device. It's tied to the user and their iTunes, so that works well. So uh, a significant part of the device management all works. Uh, the DEP, the device enrollment program, is that part where it's an institution device and gives them that greater management, like I said, with a device reset of somebody getting past a, a system that they shouldn't have. The other part is the, the Casper focus piece that I mentioned, the classroom piece, uh, does require a concept through Apple called supervision. Typically, supervision was done with Apple Configurator. Now it's done with device enrollment program. It's a simple process. A personally owned device, that's a challenge. On a small scale, we have a lot, some institutions that have simply implemented a policy because uh, students are bringing some of their own devices. And if it's an iPad, they are requiring them to bring it to IT department and have it supervised. And it can just be removed when the student leaves the institution. So on a small scale, that works. On a large scale, you probably wouldn't implement the Casper focus. Uh, and a follow-up with, we are seeing higher ed institutions because of this, they, many are switching to buying the devices themselves, implementing device enrollment program with supervision, because they see Casper Focus as a great tool for professors in the class when they want to do assessments. If a student leaves the college or university, they simply remove it from device enrollment program, the student walks away. So it, uh, it's a challenge, however, that people are finding ways to solve it, and they're just seeing the tool very valuable uh, to, you know, I, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds. My own daughter goes to an educational institution, and she has her own technology, and every single professor tells her to put it away when she goes in the room. And that is becoming an epidemic in the higher ed community. And that's why we're seeing some, because they want this tool like Casper Focus. Uh, so a little longer answer, but uh, it does, most of what we do supports the individual stuff. The, the Casper Focus classroom piece is where you have a little bit of a, a, a thing that you have to think about. Okay. And just, just to clarify, I just want to follow up on, on something you said. So if, uh, if this were a, a, a mass purchase of iPad, would, would students and teachers possibly be able to have some of their own apps and devices, uh, own apps on the, on the iPad, as well as the stuff that is being provisioned through the central administration? Is that possible? So that is the decision and choice. Uh, uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, it, however, um, some institutions have implemented a cross-the-board no because we're afraid that some of the students will be downloading inappropriate apps or they'll be using those in a, other apps during class time. And so they have decided not to and uh, to lock the app store out. Today, with the Casper Suite, you can, you can allow it open and let people download what they want and add district stuff. You can limit it to only what the district does, but then you can also personalize that, and you can give certain people the privilege of having both the App Store access. One of the ways we, rather than restricting, we can, you know, decide certain apps are not appropriate that's put out to the school, and you can monitor if someone installs something that was, you know, told to be that shouldn't be, and you can have reporting um, and actions actually taken. So, for instance, if most people concerned there's, there's a handful of apps they don't want students to have, you make a, a list, and rather than not letting them be able to install it, you get a record, and you can actually uh, make something happen to the device, like please come to the IT department if they do, and so. Um, rather than restricting all people. So the option is there to have either, and the great thing is you get to start having a discussion about it now, whereas previously it was like a yes or no. Now it can be a how do we want to do this. Great. Well, thank, thank you for clarifying that. Well, let's turn to another question. Uh, there are actually two that I'm going to combine here. 
Um, one is about Apple DEP, and just to clarify whether it, it works only with devices purchased directly from Apple, and then after that, what does it take to get DEP set up? Terrific, and and I will tell you that we we have a very specific um, webinar. You know, this is recorded. You can just go in and watch on on implementing the Apple DEP or Device Enrollment Program. Um, how to get set up. We actually have our own hosted webinar next week on implementing a, a separate one. So I will direct you to Jeff for some specifics. Uh, primarily, and keep in mind the device enrollment program has evolved. Um, not that long ago, it was only available like in the U.S. Now it's evolved into other countries. And one of those reasons that it took a little delay is most U.S. K-12 institutions buy from Apple then that's very easy. If you buy from Apple at the time of purchase. If you have previously purchased devices, you can coordinate through Apple and, and get retroactively get those into the device enrollment program. The dilemma around the rest of the world is a lot of people use resellers, and they didn't buy directly from Apple, and that took a little delay. So there is a program. You just basically need to work with uh, Apple a, in order to bring those devices in. Um, if you're a U.S. institution, uh, there will probably be some legwork to do that. It's kind of uh, having some original purchasing information. And uh, all I can – best for me to tell you is, yes, you can. Uh, there are some ways to do it that are well out of the scope of the next couple minutes. But we at JAM have the expertise to help guide you. Um, so if you don't find the resource, certainly somebody at JAM can help you with that process or help point you to the right way to do it. But it's primarily designed for a direct purchase from Apple, and there, but there are ways to retroactively, and depending on where you are in the world, work to get those into Apple's device enrollment program. It's just much slicker if you do it at the time of purchase. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, now, there's a question from someone who already has uh, some, some iPads uh, in their schools, and they have an issue where students forget their passcodes, and they've had to reset the devices. Using device management, is there another alternative or some other way around this? Well, this is, uh, quite honestly, it was one of the very first reasons why we developed Casper, Casper Focus. Uh, we heard from teachers. We went into classrooms where teachers were using the devices. We heard from IT and teachers. One of the number one trouble ticket issues is a kid forgetting their passcode to get onto the device, locking it out, and the teacher's looking at this student, and the device becomes a brick. And that student may or may not become a behavior problem, and it, they have to call IT. IT is saying this is one of the top issues. So device management, you can, you can do it from the back end of the server. So if you have the Casper suite and you're using device management, someone forgets their passcode, IT can log in, push a command to that iPad to clear it. What we've done in Casper Focus, that teacher has in their hands on their iPad, is they select the student's iPad, they hit clear passcode, and the student's device is cleared, and within three seconds or so, the device is right back up and running. Now, caveat is the kid can hit it like 10 times and really lock themselves out. The thing is people learn that, you know, they know the teachers can help do it, so they're not going to do it 10 times. Uh, so, yes, you can do it with MDM. The best solution is to have it right in the hands of the teacher and with, with Casper Suite, if you own, you, there's no extra cost for Casper Focus, so it's sort of like a no-brainer. Put it in the hands of the teacher, no loss of instructional time. It's done right then and there on the spot. The teacher doesn't even have to turn their back to the class, and the kid's right back at work. So um, honestly, it's, uh, and it's such an important thing. So many schools are actually avoiding kids putting passcodes because of this problem, because they saw it was such a hassle. Well, think of the privacy issue you, you've avoided. So... I think you have that solved pretty good. Okay, great. Um, now, during, during your presentation, you, did, you talked a lot about the ability using device management to, to individualize uh, provisioning to, to an iPad or do it on, on a group or on a mass scale. Uh, that's great in a one-to-one -one, uh, iPad situation. What about in a shared use model? How does Casper Focus work in, in, in that situation? Oh, sure. Um, actually, it works brilliantly because it's uh, actually almost e not, I want to say easier to set up, uh, less, uh, less involvement. With a one-to-one, with -one, we tie the student information system data 
to our system to create all the classes. Um, and, and normally, so a teacher would log in and they choose the class. Well, in a shared use or cart model, um, you've got your cart. Classes are easily created. iPads are added to it. And the teacher is just given a count that then and assigns to those particular carts or shared devices, whether they have a set of six in their room. So the Casper Focus piece works exactly the same way. Distributing apps and distributing uh, material to a, a shared use model has some differences between the, the because DEP is typically assigned for one to one, and it makes it very easy to assign to an end user's iTunes account. A shared use adds a layer uh, that so you have to adjust. Um, we actually we do have how to do that um, and, and some how-to videos. I have heard that Apple is working. You know, the potential is that down the road we'll see a, a shared use model that makes it easier. Typically, people today use Apple Configurator to get apps, or they can create I, um, individual iTunes accounts for a set of iPads or individual iPads in a shared model, and that's how they can use the Casper suite to push those down, push apps and content down. But Casper Focus, actually, the device usually, it just has to be supervised. Most people take a shared use device, run it through Apple Configurator, and make it supervised. Then they can use Casper Suite and Casper Focus to do the, cas the, the classroom management. So it works well uh, for the, the management. Uh, getting apps and stuff, it really depends on how the school chooses to set the iPads up. And there's two or three scenarios that support it. Um, so I just want to encourage you that, yes, it just uh, does have some, um, it does have some things that you have to do differently than a one-to-one. -one. Okay. All right, well, we have probably time for, for one or two more questions, probably one. Uh, so I wanted to know if, if a student leaves, leaves the school, leaves the district, and can they revoke the app and reassign it to another user? Yes, and the time for questions is based on my, my long answers. The answer is yes, 100%. <laughs> uh, it's tied to the iTunes user account, and uh, the student will get an indication that it's being removed. It will give them a grace period in order to be able to go buy the app if they still want it and the, or to move their data off so they won't, it just won't disappear overnight. And, yes, the school can then immediately redistribute that app to another device. And whether the student comes, shows up, this can all be done remotely. Great. All right. Well, we, that, that was very short and sweet. So we do have time for one more. <laughs> let, 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 let's say a, a teacher – finds an app that they really like, you know, how can they use it with their students? You talked about a self-service situation with, where they can go to a, a, a central repository, but how can they pull in stuff that they found themselves, and, and how does that work? Sure. With, so, so apps, you know, districts, a lot of districts have policies for purchasing and distributing software. They've had these policies. Uh, it is done through the Casper suite. Typically, a teacher finds an app. They have to communicate with whoever has the keys, uh, access to the Casper suite, and then they add it. Now, that process could be you're talking to an instructional person or a librarian, or it could be an IT technician. The technician then goes and gets the app in the Casper suite. It takes only a couple seconds, and they do what we call scoping. They, in essence, assign it to an individual or a group. So typically, it would be like fourth grade so a teacher says, so, so it really differs from each district, but it can be done in a matter of minutes to, to the moment it's decided to it showing up. We can either force it in a way to show up on an iPad and just automatically install, or we can have it show up just in self-service. But it does require the communication from, to the person who has the uh, account into the Casper suite. And, and like I said, many school departments are handing those tasks down to school-based people versus a district technician somewhere else. Okay. Well, you have timed that beautifully. So but that is all the time that we have left today. So if any of you asked a question that we were unable to get to, uh, someone from the JAM software team will follow up to get you some answers. So as we wrap up today, I, I want to thank Dave Salt much again for an excellent presentation, and I'd also like to thank JAMP for its support. And one final reminder, we will send out an email to all attendees 
when the recording of the webinar is ready. So that brings us to a conclusion. Thank you and goodbye.